you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 8 to 10. And then we'll pray. And then, and then I'll give you a, a thought. Uh, something that I was, I've been looking at the last few days. Um, really based on what I preached last week. Uh, on the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, but First Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 8, First Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verse 8, it says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's go and pray uh, before we get started. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for a perfect word that we can study out of. Lord, thank you for just who you are. Lord, as we, as we learn about how you are worthy of our service, Lord, we pray that whatever is said here tonight just gives you glory, honor, and praise. And that the choices that we make, Lord, uh, can bring us back to you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in 1 Thessalonians, uh, this is where we're going to jump off from. Uh, this will be, be the springboard, if you will. In verse number 9, uh, it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols. Do you realize when you got saved, that's what you did? Now, I know what you guys might be thinking. Well, well Brad, I, I wasn't actually you know, bowing down to a statue. I wasn't actually doing this. But, but an idol is just anything you place before God. And what we're going to see is that a lot of us were worshiping ourselves. And so what we did was we turned from self-worship to God-worship at the moment of salvation, right? We stopped trusting in ourselves to get us to where we can't get ourselves as we started trusting in Christ. But then he continues, it says, How he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We talked last week about the judgment seat of Christ and how as Christians we all are going to stand before Jesus Christ and be judged for our service as a servant to our Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing sometimes we overlook when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ and that's who is doing the judging. And that's Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times, and and I believe this, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, we talked about this, you know, that the foundation is Jesus Christ, and we build on that foundation. And that some of the things we build on that foundation is who you are in Christ, right? That's the subfloor. That's that first layer above the foundation. And that is very important. But what happens sometimes is we get so focused on who we are in Christ that we forget about who Christ is. And that who we are in Christ stems from who Christ is and what Christ is. And so what we're going to do is is we're going to talk today about serving, but we're going to talk to it a little bit different way. We're going to talk about why we should, why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service. You know, I'm going to prove to you, uh, you know, when I'm at the college, when I was at the college, we always had training sessions. And one of the things they always talked about was, you know, the class that's coming in, right? The next set of students that we're going to see. And, you know, this generation that is coming up is very interested in that why question, right? They're not interested in doing something because somebody tells you to. They're interested in doing something because you explain why it's important for them to do. 
That's what I'm going to do today. As Christians, we should be serving Jesus Christ. And here we're going to look at why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service. Because, as Christians, and, and as humans, I should say, whenever we talk about service, whenever we talk about obedience, there's this little voice. Everyone has it. I have it. There's a little voice in the back of our mind that says, how dare you tell me what to do? You know, there, there's that little rebel, if you will, in each one of us. But I'm going to say that obviously what we're going, who we serve in Jesus Christ is much better than anything we can serve for ourselves. You know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you would agree with the statement that says, In the last days perilous times shall come. You would agree with me that we're in some perilous times, correct? You know, I heard, this, I heard a sermon preached from that and say, well, you know, the North Koreans are going to come over and bomb us, and the Russians are going to... You know, when Paul, if you were to read that section, Paul never once talks about the North Koreans. He never once talks about the Russians. But you know what he says? He says, in, in the latter days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves. You know, that's a big key in perilous times. And you know, in today, there's a lot of people who love themselves. You know, it says there, there's 25 or so things that he then lists about the perilous times, uh, and maybe we'll, we'll look at it in another time. But one of the things he lists, he says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And I'm going to try to, to show you out of the Bible today why we should be lovers of God more than lovers of pleasure. Why Jesus Christ is worthy of of our service. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So we're going to look at four things. There's a lot more than four. Maybe I'll just stay over here so then the people at night. No, there's more than four th there's more obviously more than four things about why Jesus Christ deserves our worship I, or our service. I'm just going to look at, at four of them. And the first one is because he purchased it. One of the reasons why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service is because he paid the price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore... Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, one reason why Jesus is worthy of our service is because he bought us. You know, he paid the price for us. And, and you know, it was a really large price. You know, the, it's interesting to think about that. You know, the value of something. That, you know, a lot of things, you know, we talk about inherent value. Do you realize the value that something has is placed on the person who wants it? You know, Jesus Christ, God wanted us. So you know what the price he was willing to pay for it? His son's blood. He was willing to pay. That's an expensive, costly price. You know, 1 Corinthians, uh, we're here in, in verse 19, it says, Ye are not your own. As Christians, we are owned by God. I understand that, you know, just hearing that, you know, when I was going through this, I, I, I kind of shivered a little bit. You mean I'm not my own man? You know, that, that, that's what the modern, the modern day thought is. Is right, I am my own fill in the blank. Man, woman, teen, child. I can do whatever I want. Not if you're a Christian. Not if you're a Christian. You can't do whatever you want. You do what God wants. Right? You, we are to serve God. You know, and, the, and, and, and as we talk about, the, you know, Pastor brought this up and, and on Sunday morning when he was talking about the crucifixion and, and just thinking about the price he paid. You know, he left out a few things. You know, he left out in Isaiah where it says he was beaten so bad you could not even tell that he was a man. He was beaten so bad. And, and I looked at Amy when he started talking about it, and I'm like, you know, us with beards? 
Imagine getting a beard just ripped out of the skin. That's what he did for us. And we think, as Christians, we can stand before him and say, you know what, God, you want me to do this? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. As servants, we are responsible to do the will of the master. You know, there, there's a lot of times, uh, you know, since Christ purchased us, we need to do what he tells us to do. You know, there's a lot of us who have, you know, let somebody borrow something, you know, a couple bucks, and we hold it over them. And we say, hey, you, you know, I need this done. Hey, I need help moving on Friday. Can you help me? I got plans. Hey, remember that time I let you borrow two bucks? Time to pay up. And some of us, as Christians, right, God paid his own son for us. And, and, you know, he says, hey, hey, I want you to go to the mission field. Hey, I want you to witness to this person. I want you to pass a track. And we're like, no. And God's like, hey, I paid it. It's time to repay. You know, one of the reasons why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service is because he purchased it with his own blood. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, this goes along, right? With, with serv- and, and, and I was thinking, thinking about this, you know, about some of the stuff, you know, that people are struggling with in here. Um, and, and some of the stuff that we just go through uh, day after day after day. And I was thinking, wait a minute, if we start to, to think about this stuff, and we start to really meditate on it. You know, this helps us get our mindset on the right things. You know, if, if we're struggling, right, we could say, hey, you know what? Christ died for me. He loved me enough to die for me. He loved me. He will see me as we see. He will see me through. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, Another reason why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service is because he is the author and finisher of our faith. I was thinking about that uh, over the last couple days, that word author, right? And just thinking about what an author does, right? We have have some authors, we have some writers here uh, in the church, and, and and, and if you think about it, what does the author do? The author sits above everything, above the character, right? He sits outside of, of the story, and so the author is able to see everything. You know, just like Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ sits back and can see everything. He can see everything. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this, right? He knows the path that we will take, whether good or bad. And he knows the end of it. And he can see it, right? This is why in Hebrews it talks about chastisement, right? God trying to get us back on the right path because he loves us that much. Um, and so, so he knows the path that we're going to take. As pastors, because I was thinking about this. Ah, so what you're saying, Brett, is there's going to be a plan B, right? If, I go on the, if I'm on the right path and then I just kind of fall off, and, but I can never get back. No, right? Because God sits outside of time. There is no such thing as a path B. There's only a path, right? There's only one path that we're walking. There's only one race that we're running. Sometimes we, we get off a little bit and that's okay. We just need to get back on it. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever read these books. This, you know, this sermon actually brought back some nostalgia to me. Have you ever read the Create Your Own Adventure books? Have you ever read those, right, where you open it up and it says, hey, maybe, you know, I'm not that old. Uh, you know, you open it up and you, and, you re- and you start the story and then it says, hey, if you want to go into the cave, go to page 30. 
if you want to run the opposite way, like a normal person, go to page 75, right? And then you would flip over and you would read the story, right? This is what, like, God is, right? We have a choice to choose which way we're going to go. And God knows all of it. And God is still there with us through it all. You know, one of the ways that I would use to read those creature own adventure novels, though, just to be honest, time of confession, I guess, confess your faults, right, is I would cheat. Right? I would go and read each of the pages, each of the choices, and then be like, yeah, this one's cooler, I'll go there. There's none of that in this life. Right? We can't look ahead and read the way things are going to turn out. We can know, we can guess, like what Pastor's talking about, where it's walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh, but th- there's no going in the future. You know, Each one of us, if you are saved, has a course. As a servant, we have a course that God would like us to fulfill. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, I, w- I have finished my course. What a great thing to say as a servant. You know, God, you wanted me to do this. Guess what? I finished it. I finished it. You wanted me to do this? I did it. You know what he's going to say to that person? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. Or at least in one hand, Let's put Isaiah 55 in one hand and then flip over to Proverbs 14 in another. You know, one reason why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service is because he is the author and finisher of our faith. You know, a good servant never questions the master about their course. You know, the, Jesus Christ puts us on a course and he sets the course for us, right? He, he sets it up. And he says, go. As a servant, we should not question that course. And you might be asking, well, why? Because the master can see things that we can't. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Isaiah 55, verse 8. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's flip over to Proverbs chapter 14, and then we'll talk about these passages. Proverbs chapter 14 In verse 12, it's interesting that the same word is used in both of these passages. Talking about God and His ways and the things that He can see and our ways. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The master can see more than the servant. You know, there are a lot of times where we think, yeah, I'm going the right way. I got it. Look, the, the road is wide. Look, it's easy. I got it. I can see it. Look, my way, I, I'm going my way. And God's up there saying, no, that's not the way you're supposed to go. Take this way. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I know. I'm sitting up here watching all of it. You know, it's interesting, right, that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is there at the beginning of our pathway, at the beginning of our journey. He's also there at the end. And you know what else? Every step that we take, he's with us as well. Jesus is just there with us. Philippians Chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, right? Something that we can be confident in, something that we should stand firm on. It says that he which hath begun a good work, hath begun a good work. There he is at the beginning. In you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's the end. He's there at our beginning. He's there at our end. And he's there every step of the way. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This this, this ties in to the next point 
on why Jesus Christ is worthy of our service. You know, he purchased it. He bought it. He's the author and finisher of our faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, start in verse 23. Jesus Christ is faithful. That's why he's worthy of our, pray, or of our service and praise and worship and all those other things. It's because he's faithful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. You know, I, I, I didn't have time. I, I, I tried to make like a seven-point outline, but we just didn't have time. Just joking. But I tried to add an extra point in here about the truth. Right? Jesus Christ is faithful to the point where if he says something, he, it is going to be done. You know, it is going to be done. Faithful is defined as firmly adhering to duty, of true fidelity, loyal, true to allegiance. You know, when you get saved, you become part of God's family. You know, when you, be, when you get saved, you become Jesus, the brother of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, that, you become part of God's family. We need to serve God because he is there every step of the way. He is faithful. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise. You know, Jesus Christ is faithful. You know, there are times, you know, when, when God tells us to do, this, this is, you know, the, the last two points kind of run together, but there are times when Jesus Christ tells us to do something. You know, have you guys ever been at school? I'm sure you guys have. Where the teacher says, hey, I want you to do this homework. And you're thinking, why? And you actually ask the teacher, and the teacher's actually honest this time, and says, well, I just want you to go do homework. Get out of here. There's no purpose to it. It's busy work. You guys have heard of busy work? You know who doesn't do that? Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, when he, it's, it's funny, and, and I'm, I'm jumping all over my last point, but that's okay. When he tells us to do something, not only is he there with us to do it, not only is he there to show us or, or to tell us in his Bible how to do it, but he already did it. Think about that. Here is a master that is telling us what to do, and he's already done it. He's already gone and, and preached to people. He witnessed to people. He was rejected by people. God, I don't want to go because what if they laugh at me? You know what they were doing to Jesus Christ on the cross? Laughing at him. He did it. You know, Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary uh, to China. He said, all God's giants, right? All those people that we look at and we think, man, they're spirit-filled. Man, look at them. They've done a great work. All of God's giants have been weak men and weak women who have gotten a hold of God's faithfulness. If you are weak, that is fine. You know why? Because God can use you. Because you realize you can't do it yourself. Because we can't. But you know who can? God can. And you know who I, why we can do it? Because God is in us. And God is faithful. And if he tells you to go do something, he's going to be there to help you. It's a promise. You know, there will be times in our service with God where we will falter. We're not perfect. There will be times when we fall in our walk. You know what? First John, let's go to First John. First John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. There are times where we will mess up. But you know what happens during those times? Jesus, God, is still faithful. He's still there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins... 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is faithful. He is there to watch over us. He is there to keep us. He is there to go with us every step of the way. He is faithful. Why is Jesus Christ worthy of our service? One, he bought it. Two, he's the author and finisher. Three, he's faithful. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and I have to tell you, this is, this is the point that really drove it home for me. Right? This is, this is the point. All the, other, the, the points are good. But this one is the one that, that, that just drove it home, that made me really stop and consider why is Jesus Christ worthy of my service? And have I been serving him the way that he deserves? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Start in verse 12. It says, For we commend not ourselves again unto you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, start in verse 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth, right, you get saved, you should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again, right? There, there's the first point, right? If you are saved here today, you are no longer of yourselves. You know, Romans 14 talks about whether we live or die, we are Christ. You know what the context of, of that passage was? The judgment seat of Christ. You know what we find here in 2 Corinthians 5, a few verses before we read about this? The judgment seat of Christ. That is not a coincidence that, those two, that this is found in conjunction with the judgment seat of Christ. Because it's talking about our service. So, why is Christ worthy of our service? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. You know, it talks about the love of Christ. Now, I was thinking about this, and, and I, I was thinking about this one all day. You know, it's not just the love of Christ for us that constrains us to do the things we should be doing. It's the love that we have for Christ. The love that we have. So, so it's, a, it's, it's God to us, but it's also, I love Christ. I have the love of Christ in me. And that constrains me to do what I need. Constraining uh, means to compel or force. To urge with irresistible power. That's God. You know, when, when God calls you to do something, and you know God calls you to do it, there is just that irresistible power to do it. And that you look back and you think, man, only God did that. Or with a power sufficient to produce the effect. And that's what constrain means. You know, thinking about how God loved us. I might just preach his sermon again, right? Thinking about how God loved us and what Christ did for us. Who are we to say no when he tells us to hand out a tract? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't do that. I, it, it's too hot. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, you know we, we talked about this when you we were talking about the judgment seat of Christ, right? We'll, we'll get up there and, and, and we'll be judged for our works and, and you know, we'll do what humans naturally do and that's make excuses, right? We've been doing it since the Garden of Eden. Just making excuses. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to put up his hands and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And we're going to see the nail prints in his hand. And we're going to stop. And we're going to think, man, that's right. He did that for me. He did that for me. You know, 
it, it's just, I, I just imagine, right? You can imagine Paul. And, and again, I'm stepping, I guess, outside of the pulpit because it's not explicitly written in here. But you can imagine Paul walking down the street, you know, and meeting somebody who knew Paul before, like when he was Saul, right? When he was persecuting the church, when he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and, and, and he knew all of the law. You know, and, and you can imagine this person just asking him, right? Just say, hey, hey Paul. Uh, he'd probably call him Saul, but it doesn't matter. Why are you doing this? Right? Why are you going around talking about this, this Jesus Christ? The people you used to persecute. Why did you leave everything you had worked for to follow Christ? If you think about it, Paul had everything. Paul was a learned man. Right? He studied at the feet uh, of the, the best Pharisees. Right? He said, of the Pharisees, I, you know, I'm blameless. But you know what Paul did? He says he counted it all but dung. So here comes this person saying, Paul, why did you leave it all behind? You know what Paul says? I can just see, I can just see Paul saying this. A smile comes on his face, and he says, well, I have to. And you could just imagine the look on the other guy. Yeah, you have to? Yeah. I love Christ. I love Christ. And all the things that Jesus tells me to love and tells me to do, those are the things I'm going to do. Because I love him. That's what the love of Christ does for us. The love of Christ makes us do some things that to the world, they would look at you and say, man, you're... Not smart. My mom did that. You know, when, when, when I was first called to preach, uh, just a little back of it, my mom thought I got saved just because of Amy. That I was just playing church to get the girl, you know, and, and to do all this stuff. And then, you know, I get called to preach. And then my mom's like, well, are you done playing church yet? This is a little bit too much. Right? You're gone a little bit too far now. No, I love Christ. Christ loves me. I do what he tells me to do. He is worthy of our praise. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. We see a story in Genesis chapter 20. We'll read verses, uh, verse 18. But, but in this story, ju just to set the background, uh, we meet a guy uh, by the name of Jacob, right? And Jacob uh, was told by his parents, hey, do not find people here in the land of Canaan. I want you to go back to our people and, and find a wife there. Jacob says, you got it. Um, and so he goes and he travels. And, you know, he's at a well. And he sees this woman. And he likes this woman. She was pretty. She was so pretty that he started to cry. Now, ladies, we might have some questions about that. I know that's what Eric did when he saw a whisper, though, right? I think Eric cried when, when he proposed, but uh, instead of the other way around. Um, so, right? But, but he cries at seeing... Uh, at, at seeing Rebecca, or at seeing Rachel, and so he, so but so what he does is, you know, he's strong and he and he takes off the covering of the well, and they're able to water their flocks, and and so Rachel goes back to Laban, and they're like, you "Guys are early. What's going on? You don't usually water the flocks till later." And and Rachel says, "Well, oh, there's this guy. There's this guy. Uh, let's go to verse 15. Let's read in Genesis 29, verse 15. We'll pick up the story." Uh, it says, And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? Hey, you want to work for me? That's great, but I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you. Tell me what your wages are. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger 
daughter. I was thinking about this, how long seven years is. And I was thinking about Evelyn, our, our, our middle daughter. Uh, she's six. He was going to work for one more year just to get the chance to marry Rachel. That's a long time. Verse 19, it says, And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Uh, abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And, and, and here's the key thing to get from this story. And it says, And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. You know, when we serve God, it shouldn't be like pulling teeth for us. If we truly loved God, it should not, we, we should be able to serve him for years and then look back and say, that was fast. Where did the time go? Right? Because here he says, I'll, I'll serve you. He, he worked the seven years. And, and Jacob says, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. We have two more places to turn to. Ah, plenty of time. 1 Thessalonians. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because I like the way Paul describes it here. And what you actually see, it's quite interesting what Paul does here in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. And we read verses 8 to 10 to start, uh, where he talks about how he turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for the Son from heaven. Right? He, he's talking about us getting saved, us serving, and then Christ coming back. There, there's a parallel to this within this chapter. And it's found in verse 3. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. And I want you to just focus on that, that part where he says, to serve the living and true God. Here's the parallel that he makes in, in verse 3. It says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. It says, in patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. He calls it a labor of love. You know, if we love God enough, if we love God, the way we say it. If we love God the way we say it. You know when he tells us to do something, our response would be, yeah, I got it. I got it for you. You know, I love my wife. I love her a lot. And you know when she tells me, hey, Brett, can you take out the trash? Yeah, I'll get it. I love you enough. I don't want you to carry that stuff. Because for some reason, I always buy the bags that rip. So then I, I'll, I'll take that one for you because I love you enough to take out the garbage. Right? If we love somebody enough, we're willing to sometimes go out of our way to do something for them. I remember when Amy was pregnant uh, with all of our kids, she'll just be sitting there one time and say, you know, I could really use some chocolate. What do you want? I'll go get it. This will be at like 10 o'clock at night. If you know me, I'm in bed by 9.30. That's love. Putting off your bedtime to get your pregnant wife chocolate, right? But, but I was willing to do it because I loved her. I love Jesus Christ. He loves me. When he tells me, hey, I want you to go do this. Got it. You got it. It's going to cost you something. Yeah, okay. You're faithful. You already paid the price for me. You know, you love me. We're going to go to 1 Peter 2. We're going to go to 1 Peter 2 to finish. We've, we've preached out of this section, I think, every sermon for the last who knows how many. We preached out of 1 Peter chapter 2. And, and this, is, this, this is why this got me, right? Is, is God loves us enough that God will not put us through something that he hasn't already gone through. Hey, I know you're going to struggle with this. So did I. Hey, I know you're tempted this way. 
hey, I know, I know if you go this way and you do this thing, there's going to be some stuff, pitfalls on the road. Hey, I already traveled there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For even here and too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who which he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges, judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. That's love. Not just the sacrifice, but what he says, where he says, leaving uh, for us, leaving us an example. Hey, you know what? I'm going to call you to go to this place. I've already, I, I've already been there, right? I've already had to leave my home. I've already had to leave my family. I've had my family forsaken me. I've done this. I've done that. I had my, my best friend died, right? And he wept. And, and all this other stuff. I have been there. You know, one of the things, uh, this isn't a point in the sermon, but one of the things that, that I love about Jesus Christ is that when I go to him with my problems, he can put his arm around me and said, I know how it feels. You know, there's power in that. There's pow- when, when I was, was uh, uh, preaching in, in Indiana, my, my first week as the pastor of the church, one of the, the oldest members there lost her husband. I looked at Amy and I said, Amy, I don't know how that feels. I can console her the best I can, but I don't know how it feels. You know how powerful it is for somebody to have gone through something, to put their arm around you and said, hey, I know how it feels, but you know what? God is faithful. You know, God is faithful to get us through it. You know, God loves us enough that even while we are going through this, he already went through it. So, Jesus Christ is worthy of our service. You know, we sing that song, Thou Art Worthy. He is worthy of our service. He deserves for us as Christians to serve Him. Because He bought it. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He is faithful to what He says. And He loves us. And he loves us. You know, Joshua asked a question to the nation of Israel before he left. He says, choose you this day whom you will serve. You know, that question still stands for us today. That question still stands, who will we choose to serve? You know, it says in the latter, in the latter, times, in the latter days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves. There's one choice. You yourself are the master. Here's the other choice. Jesus Christ. We saw today why he is worthy of our service. Why don't we start to serve him today and show him that he actually is worthy of it? Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. He is faithful. He is faithful. E- even if we haven't been serving him the way, and, and there's things that I need, right? I, you know, every time I preach, I, I always think that we should put a mirror, partially not so that I could see myself, but just so that I can, when I'm preaching, I can look right back at me. Because there are times in our walk with Christ where we do not serve him the way he deserves it. And we do not show him the worth that he has. And this is the person who's going to judge us based on those worth, based on that service. And so today is a great day to start thinking about what he has done for us and why he is worthy of our service and start to serve him.
the way he wants. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, we love you. And we are so thankful that you love us. And so, Lord, we pray that all of the things that were said here about you just gave you glory, honor, and praise. And, Lord, we pray that, that we can start making some decisions to serve you, to start walking after you, to start listening to you. Lord, you say we can't serve two masters. So, Lord, let us choose you. Lord, we pray uh, that the Holy Ghost would have a work, uh, that your word would have free course in here. Lord, and during this time of prayer, Lord, we just pray that you be with, be with all of us as we pray. And we thank you again for everything you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a few minutes there at your seat. Uh, if you would like, uh, as the piano plays, if you'd like to, to pray and, and just talk to God.